The sermon is entitled, Dragon Naturally Speaking. Now, you know I like to play on words. Uh, But it's important that I let you know why that title is so significant. Dragon Naturally Speaking, for those of you that are not computer buffs, is a program that allows you to speak into your computer and it writes or types or displays what you say. But in order for it to be effective, you train the computer to understand the way you pronounce words. When it becomes accustomed to the sound of your voice, to the way that you enunciate, then and only then is it able to properly communicate what is being projected. And so for dragon naturally speaking to work, the computer says it'll give you a line of statements and code and it says repeat after me. And as you continue reading, It becomes accustomed to the sound of your voice, your enunciations, your inflections. And then it begins to communicate in print, in writing, in lettering, what you're actually saying. But you train it by the way you speak. And today we're going to to see, according to God's word, that our minds are being trained to think a particular way because the dragon in Revelation is naturally speaking. He's communicating through society, through newspaper, through political maneuverings. All of the final movements that will take place in our world before Jesus comes. If you have your Bibles today with you, go with me to the reading of the scripture reading, Revelation chapter 13. And we're going to look briefly at verse 11. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the, out of the earth. He had how many horns? Two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Bow your heads as I go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we are living in a very grand and awesome time. And your word is coming to pass with blazing accuracy. Not only are we seeing movements around the world coming together at a rapid pace, but we also see the impact on spiritual lives. We see the impact in the world, in society, in the family, in the churches, in the halls of politics. We see the stage being set for the final movements to be rapid. And so, Father, speak to us today that we will not only hear what the Spirit is saying, but we will be able to tune our ears to know that what the dragon is speaking will one day cease and only your voice will be heard. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'd like to begin with three questions this morning because this this sermon, I get excited about religious liberty because it brings to the table something that many of us are not even aware of. Religious liberty introduces to us a platform that we often overlook in the basic elements of life. We, We see life going by day to day and we often miss what is being communicated. And so therefore, we often tend to think that what we see is exactly what it is. But what I want to tell you today is what we're seeing happening on the political front, on the social front, on the moral front, on the religious front, is what the Lord saw thousands of years ago. And so what's exciting about our day and age 
is if I knew that I only had five more exits left before my destination and my destination was going to be complete freedom and deliverance eternally from sin, I would get excited. What I'm seeing today, the signs that are taking place in our world today is saying soon and very soon, all the problems of this world will no longer be a memory. But revelation has to happen first. And so the questions I'd like you to consider today as, as we see this beast in Revelation riding the agitating waves of approaching events, Revelation introduces the, most, the two most significant components of the closing acts in the scenes of our world's history. I don't know, I don't know if it strikes you the way it does me sometimes, but I, 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 am, I use the word excited, but I'm even more than that. I am so thankful that the world, in all of its trials and all of its tribulations, will soon one day not even be a memory. All the trials in the political world, all the agitations in Washington, D.C., all the quagmire of the news networks, one day we won't hear any voice but the voice of our God. And the devil knows that. That's why he tries his best to conceal the messages of revelation because he knows that an understanding revelation, he will be unveiled before the world as to the final movements that will take place. And he knows when those final movements are over, Jesus is going to come again. But there are people today losing faith because they're not paying attention to the final signs. There are people today that are losing hope because they are not paying attention to what God's Word is saying and how God has established and outlined these final events for every one of us to pay particularly close attention to. The three questions... As we look at the two players that are introduced in Revelation chapter 13, if you have your Bibles, turn there with me. Because Revelation is divided at the line of verse 10, and then the second scene in Revelation is introduced in verse 11. There are two major players in the book of Revelation. And these two major players are alive and well today. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 to 10 reintroduces the power of Rome. What power did I just say? The power of Rome. The fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. Revelation chapter 13 verse 11 introduces one of the most significant players. And when I go to places like Australia and New Guinea and other countries around the world, I'm able to say to people that are in different countries, let them know what's taking place here in America, because whether you realize it or not, the final and the most significant movements to take place on the stage of Bible prophecy are going to take place here in America. Did you know that? It's going to take place here in America. So what you see happening in America is very significant. But the question that I want to ask today is on one side we have Rome, the papacy, headed by the pontiff today, Pope Francis. On the other side, we have the United States, headed by our president, Donald Trump. And we've had various presidents, regardless of who may be in the seat, the agenda is the same regardless of who the pope is, and the agenda is the same regardless of who the president is. The agenda doesn't change. And the reason I know that is because the Bible has forecasts. And Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10 says, the Lord says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. So I'm excited today. But as I take you back to the formation of the second power of Revelation chapter 13, and the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13 that this beast is described as a lamb-like beast. A what kind of beast, church? Lamb-like. Now, I don't know if you know about a lamb or not, but lambs are some of the most docile and pleasant animals to be around. 
But the Bible says that lamb will one day begin to speak as a dragon. And only as you put your ear to the political pavement, to the social pavement, can you realize that America, not just in this present administration, but America has been speaking more like a dragon from the mid-80s to the present than ever before. And so what the Bible has introduced to us, it does us well to reintroduce ourselves and refamiliarize ourselves. We are living, praise the Lord, we are living in the closing scenes of earth's history. And today you're going to, now there are those who are skeptical and say, well, you know, my father and his father and his father said the world is ending and my father's father died and his father died and my father eventually died. So what's different? We're going to find out today that there are things happening today that has never happened before in human history. And the Bible says these things must occur before the coming of the Lord. But when you look at the two powers that are in existence today, Rome, who dominated the world during the Dark Ages, who subjected men to the powers and the dictates of the popes and the bishops, and then the United States that God brought into existence for the purpose of religious freedom, you might ask yourself the question, since Rome received its power from the dragon, and one day this lamb-like nation will begin to speak like a dragon, how on earth can two powers that appear to be so diametrically opposed, how can they possibly unite? When God brought them in existence for completely opposite reasons, God raised up the United States to prevent Rome from dominating the world. But how can this lamb-like nation, how can this contending authority eventually merge with a power that it's diametrically opposed to? What does it take for opposing movements to fuse? Go, go back with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to see an unfolding scene we're going to intrude on a scene of unimaginable importance. Revelation chapter 12, and let's look together at verse 13. And the Bible says, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the what? Talk to me today. He had been cast to the what? He had been cast to the earth. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Now, this is in a significant text in the Bible because the Bible says, when he saw that he'd been cast to the earth. Now, in the minds of many of us, we said, wait a minute. When was he cast to the earth? Now, the casting of the earth or the scene that's introduced here in Revelation chapter 12 begins with the word now. What word, Mike? Now. now. It begins with the word now, which means something took place that did not happen prior to that. Something took place in that verse that catapulted us to the final stages. And the question is, what happened? Look at Revelation chapter 12 and now go back to verse 10. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. And we're going to see the word again. The Bible says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, What's the next word? Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been what, friends? Has been cast down. Now, I want to break this down very carefully because what you may not know is what those two verses, verse 13 and verse 10 says, introduces us to something that had to happen at a particular time in history. But now go to verse 7 to 9 in Revelation chapter 12. Look at this. Revelation chapter 12, verse 79, verse 7 to 9. And we read the following words. And war broke out where? In heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, and they did not prevail. Nor was a pla place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. He was what? He was cast out. 
that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were what? Cast out with him. Now watch this. This is powerful. One says he was cast out. The other one says he was cast down. Now you might say it's the same thing, but it's not the same thing. Because in the beginning, during the time of the creation of this world, the Bible said, as we just read, there was war in heaven. Did Michael win? Yes or no? Yes, he did. What happened to the dragon? He was cast what? He was cast out. And his angels were what? Cast out with him. That's when Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 took place. Now, before you go there, before you go there, let me unwrap the scene. Lucifer is overthrown. He's now no longer Lucifer, but he's now Satan. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan, Revelation 12 and verse 9. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan. He's cast to the earth. He's now in the garden. He brings before the woman the temptation. But he brings before her, and this is very significant, he brings before Eve the temptation not because of what she has, but because of who she has access to. Now, this is going to be powerful. What he really wants is not what the woman has, but what he wants is what Adam has. You've got to follow this. This, this, is, this, is, this is very deep. Not because I said so, but you'll see in a moment. Go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Go there with me. Because when Satan was cast out, he no longer had any dominion. He lost his former standing. He no longer had the position that God had given to him. He was cast out. He no longer had access he no longer had access to the courts of heaven. He was defeated. Amen, somebody. But you have to remember the claim he made. He said, I will be like the, I'd be like the most high. How can you be like the most high if you have no dominion, if you have no kingdom, if you're not in control of anything? And so the temptation that he brought to Eve was far deeper than just getting her to fall into sin because he doesn't like God. It was far deeper than that. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Satan's temptation to, Satan's desire to, tempt, to tempt man was, was motivated not purely out of hatred for God, but Adam had something that he wanted. Genesis 1 and verse 26. Notice what God gave Adam. Then God said, let us make man in what? Our image. According to our what? Likeness. Let them have what? Dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over how much of the earth? All the earth. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. What did Adam have? Adam had what? He had dominion. God gave Adam dominion over everything living and over the entire planet. But how could Satan be a ruler if he had nothing to rule? He couldn't rule anything. And not only that, he lost access. And what we did not know until the book of Job was there were meetings held. There were divinely appointed meetings held. And the representatives of unfallen worlds were allowed into that meeting. And only those that had authority could come. But if you had no dominion, you could not appear. If you had no access, if you were not in charge of anything, if you had no dominion and no authority, you were not allowed to be in that sacred setting. So when Satan led Adam to sin, as, as Romans 5 and verse 12 says, by one man sin entered the world, Adam lost the very thing that God gave him and now Satan once again had dominion. He took the dominion that God gave to Adam, and you got to get this, what he wanted more than anything else was to have dominion over all the earth. 
This is, this, is an, this is the early introduction to what's happening today. He wanted to be in control of everything happening on the earth, but he had to have dominion. Look at Job chapter 1, verse 6. But he had to go through Eve to get to Adam. You know, a lot of people say, I have to go through your wife to get to you. Well, that's, that's probably true in many marriages. You got to go through the woman to get to the man. Satan did not directly attack Adam. He attacked Eve. He had to go through Eve to get to Adam. Eve is a woman. A woman in prophecy represents what? This, this is really, I'm unfolding something. The woman represents the church. Adam, the first Adam, failed. Did he not? Did the last Adam succeed? The last Adam is who? Christ. Now, why, this is powerful. Because in the very beginning, there was the woman and there was Adam. The first woman fell into transgression. The first Adam failed. But there was always a woman. God always had a church. He calls her the woman. But he's the last Adam. Where the first Adam failed, the last Adam succeeded. Can the church say amen? But the first Adam had something that Lucifer wanted. Lucifer now calls Satan. So he had to get Adam to fall into transgression. He had to get Adam to fall to, to gain access to what Adam had dominion over. But he couldn't get to Adam directly, so he went through the woman. And Paul says in Timothy, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 14. But now... Let's catapult before we read Job chapter 1. Let's set the stage. Thousands of years later, Jesus sets up another woman. The woman is the church, and he is the last Adam. He has something that Satan still wants. And what is it? Don't answer me. We're going to get there. Because the setting is amazing. When we look at it, and I want, you to, I want you to, I'm teaching today. I want you to stay with me because we're going to catapult in just a moment to the laptop. But I want you to see the setting because it's profound. It's profound. Job chapter 1, Job chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. Notice what happened. Satan could not have been in this meeting had he not taken dominion from Adam. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. He could not have come unless he gained access to what Adam had dominion over. Because he was already cast out. Now I said to you earlier, keep this in mind, there's a difference between being cast out and being cast down. You got to follow me today. If you fall asleep, you snooze, you lose. Verse 7. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. I'm comfortable. I'm at home. I'm at home. I'm walking back and forth on the earth, going to and fro in the earth. Now, are you ready? Until he took dominion from Adam, he was limited only to the tree. How did you miss that? If, did you get that? Until he took dominion from Adam, he was limited to, to only the tree. He didn't go after Eve. She had to come to the tree because that's where he was limited to, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But when he took dominion from Adam, the entire earth was permeated with the knowledge of evil. So he's now talking about the very dominion he owns. I'm walking back and forth on what belongs to me. Because until he took dominion from Adam, he was limited to the tree. Can you say amen if you just learned something? It's a powerful concept, but it's a reality. And so now, in order for Satan's plan to be complete, the initial plan he made was to be like the Most High. He took from Adam what Adam once had. 
He caused the woman, Eve, to fall into transgression. But there's another woman, and there's a second Adam he has to deal with, and that's Christ. And I want to say, before I go too far, he can't handle Jesus. Because when Jesus appeared on the scene nearly 4,000 years later, after the first Adam fell, look at how Jesus referred to Satan. John chapter 14, verse 30. You see, in order for Satan's plan to be complete, and this is what we don't understand, this whole ideology about Sunday being exalted and the church departing from truth and men exalting tradition, Satan is working behind the scenes because he wants this earth to belong to him. And the only way that he can do it is to, to embrace eternally and hold in, in bondage eternally that which just and solely belongs to Christ. But now let's look at it unfold. Let's look at this unfold. It's powerful. John chapter 14, verse 30. Look at how Jesus referred to Satan when he appeared on the scene. He said, I will no longer talk much with you. For the ruler of what world? Of what world? This world has come, and he has what? Nothing in me. The Lord referred to Lucifer, the Lord referred to Satan as the ruler of this world. What world? This world. He could not refer to him as a ruler of anything unless he took rulership from somebody that God had given it to. He gave it to Adam. But Adam lost it, and he had it. Look at John chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. Not only did Jesus, not only did Jesus call Satan the ruler of this world, but look at what he introduces him as. Look what he says. Now I said, look at this. Verse 31 and 32. Now is the judgment of this world. Look at that word. What's the first word? Now. Three times we've seen that word. Revelation 12, 10. Revelation 12, 13. Now, John chapter 12, verse 31. Look at the word. Now is the judgment of this world. Look at the word again. Say it again with me. What? Now. The ruler of this world is coming. Sorry. Now the ruler of this world will be what? Cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth will draw how many men? All peoples to myself. What Jesus was forecasting is through his death, his burial, and his victorious resurrection, Satan will be eternally defeated. Can I get an amen? That's why Satan tried his best to prevent Christ from dying successfully. Now, let me say that again, dying successfully. Now, somebody might say, how do you die successfully? Let me make it very clear. If the death of Jesus wasn't successful, his burial will be of no means and there will be no resurrection. But Jesus died successfully. What does that mean? In his death, he defeated sin, and he forever defeated the devil. Come on, somebody say it. That's why even on the cross, Satan, when he said, I thirst, Satan's attempt was to try to get Jesus to drink cheap Romans wine and vinegar mix to pollute his body so that even at the moment of his death, his sacrifice would not be acceptable. He tried at the last moments, Mike, to defeat Christ because Christ... In that singular moment, this is deep, in that singular moment, if Jesus was victorious, he would at that moment wrestle from Satan what Satan wrestled from Adam. In other words, this is my world. I built this world for Adam and Eve. You lied to her, led him in sin, stole the world back, but I came to get it back. Because my people, this belongs to my folk, not to you. What we don't understand today is what's happening. It's far deeper than politics. There's this controversy between who is going to be the ruler of this world. And Jesus said by his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And notice 
When Satan tried, when Satan failed to keep Christ in the grave, look at the words of Jesus on Resurrection Day, Matthew 28, verse 18. Look at it together. Beautiful. Matthew 28, verse 18. And you got to get this. <laughs> and Jesus came and spoke to them. This is after his resurrection. And notice what he says. And these words are deep. A lot of times we read the Bible and we think, well, that's what Matthew says, that's what Mark says, that's what Luke says. But everything in the Bible has a significance for the way that it's phrased. Jesus came and spoke to them, that's to his disciples. And what did he say? How much authority? All authority has been given to me where? In heaven and where else? Now, wait a minute. Why would he say it then if he already had it? If he already had it, he wouldn't have to say it. He had some authority in heaven, but he had to wrestle back the authority of the earth from the arch enemy. So when he came forth victoriously, I say this today, when Jesus came forth victoriously, he wrestled back the earth from the enemy of heaven. And then Jesus left. He left, Brian. He left. And he said to the disciples, start another church. <clears throat> Because the woman that Satan deceived in Eden, I'm going to put another woman in place. She's the church. And what we read in Revelation, the woman hiding in the wilderness, the devil standing before the woman to kill her child as soon as he was going to be born. The devil tried to kill Christ as a babe, but he couldn't do it. Praise God for that. He deceived Eve in the garden. He attacked Mary to destroy the authority of Jesus even as a child. He could not do it. But there's one more attack. And Jesus left, and he left a woman. He left a woman, a church, growing from the hand of 120 converted people. He left a church that began growing and growing in power and glory. And the Bible, in the picture of the white horse, said that she went forth, the church went forth, conquering and to conquer. And why is that so significant? Because every place that Satan conquered, God established the church to reconquer what Satan once owned. And the, that's why it's so significant. The very first convert, this is powerful, the very first convert into the Christian church you probably wouldn't even know who that is. A woman possessed of a demon. The devil sent a demon-possessed girl after the apostles. And the first convert was a woman motivated by a demon possession. And had the devil known and understood the authority that God had given to his apostles, he would never have sent his agent because she was delivered and became a convert into the church of Christ, a woman. Come on, somebody say amen. But now let me get the picture together. So when you go back to Revelation 12 and verse 10, let's look at that one more time. You will begin to see the context of this. This is the verse. This verse could not be said until Jesus victoriously rose from the grave and defeated the enemy on the very ground that he once claimed as his own. And today, my brothers and sisters, there are two things that belong to the Lord that Satan is very upset about. The Lord owns the earth, and he owns the church. And you'll find out how the devil feels about both. Revelation 12, verse 10, one more time. This proclamation could not have been made until Christ was victorious over every attempt of the enemy. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven. What is it saying? Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren 
who accused them before our God day and night has been what? Cast down. Now watch this. How can this be in the beginning when there was no one to accuse? There was no one to accuse. But from the cross back, Satan has been accusing. Remember what he did to Joshua? And the Lord said to him, I, I rebuke you, Satan. You're just upset because he's a brand plucked from the fire. Throughout the ages, Satan has been accusing the people of God throughout the ages. But when Jesus was victorious, he was finally cast down. And then now the final scene, Revelation 12, verse 11 and 12. This declaration separates the past from the future. How do they overcome the devil? And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. If you want to know who the Bible is referring to, just read Hebrews chapter 11. Those who died in dungeons, those who gave their lives in persecution, the Old Testament prophets, the New Testament writers, those who stood in the halls of faith, who loved salvation and truth more than their lives, they overcame him. They were willing to give their lives if that's what it took to secure their salvation. But look at the declaration of verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But look at this. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Where are we? And the sea. For the devil has come what? He's come down. Remember, you know why he came down? Because he was cast down. Cast down, but he's angry. He's come down having what? Great wrath because he knows what? That he has a what? Short time. From the time that Jesus was victorious on the day of resurrection, from that day until this, Satan knew that his time was short. Can somebody say amen? His time is short. But it's going to get, it's going to get even deeper than that because he is so upset that he lost at every point in the battle and Jesus regained access he took back the earth. He established another woman. And the Bible will tell us how Satan feels about that woman. Look at verse 17 of Revelation chapter 12. He's upset. The Lord hid her during the dark ages. He's upset. The Lord made sure that the water he sent out after the woman didn't drown her. He's upset. The Lord made sure that science and math and music and entertainment could not stamp out the gospel, and Satan is upset. In verse 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman. That means the devil is angry with the church. And went to make what? War with the remnant of her seed or the rest of her offspring. And who are they? who keep the commandments of God and have the what else? The testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, Revelation 13 now, we're going to go to the screen because I'm going to reiterate some things that some of you saw before. And next Sabbath, for the benefit of those that haven't seen it, and I know there are many of you, because I did a presentation a number of years ago on the progress of the Sunday movement around the world, and many of you have never seen it. But I want, to go back to this, I want to go back to the screen now because Revelation now introduces what Satan has done in light of his anger. He's angry with the woman that got away from him, so he establishes his own authority to come after the woman with determination and tenacity. What did God do to secure the woman? This is what Revelation says. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a what? Lamb. And spoke like a what? Dragon. The two horns that the Bible gave to the United States, those two horns represent, say it together in yellow, what's the first one? Protestantism, the foundation of our religious system. And the second one is? Republicanism, the foundation of our government. We are a republic. It's not meaning Democrat versus Republican. We are a republic. Compared to Europe, Europe was top down, but America is ground up. And by the way, let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, we better keep it ground up. Because if we turn top down, we have no voice in America. But it's bottom up, by the people, 
for the people. Exactly. For the people, by the people, by the people, for a republic from ground up. But in America, the very things that we have been blessed with, Protestantism and a, and a government that's based on a republic, is being eroded. You see, the First Amendment guarantees that these powers would peacefully coexist without either one exercising power over the other. So in America, why do we have Protestantism? Because the Protestant movement began to secure freedom that you can worship the way that you feel. No matter whether you believe in somebody else's religion or not, everybody in America has the right to worship according to their own dictates. Somebody could start a rock movement and worship rocks. And you can't say they don't have the right to do that because our government guarantees them religious freedom. And to confirm and to sustain this form of government, the First Amendment says these final words. The First Amendment says this. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of what? Speech, or of the press, or the right of the people to what? Peacefully to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. That means if I'm upset about anything, I should be able to appeal to my government. But if you've been awake at all, you'll see the very things that we have been guaranteed are being eroded in America. The very things that we are taking for granted are being eroded in America. What this simply means is Congress cannot promote one religion over the other, but that changed in 1984. When Reagan sent an ambassador to the Vatican, when Reagan sent an ambassador to the Vatican, now there were, there were ambassadors sent before, but there were never ambassadors established between a political power and a religious power. But in 1984, that got done. That was accomplished without any vote on behalf of any Americans. No American voted in favor of it, but it happened. you know why? Are you ready for the truth today? Are you really ready for it? Because what happened in 1984 is happening again today. From 1984, Ronald Reagan was put in office by the evangelicals to control the government. And both of his terms, this is fact, this is history. Read Life magazine, I have the articles. Both of his terms were contributed to the evangelicals, putting him in office so that they can finally control the dictates of the government. Have you heard of the moral majority? That's what that was all about. Have you heard of the religious right? That was, that's what that was. Jerry Falwell, Ralph Reed, Pat Robertson, James Kennedy. The intent in 1984 was for evangelicals to control the government. And so Ronald Reagan, in concession, sent an ambassador to the Vatican. So we have one there to this very day. But when he got in office the second term and they invited him to come to their, to their inaugural breakfast to celebrate his second term in office, our very wise president, Ronald Reagan, said, I cannot make any public declaration that I favor any one religion over the other, and he didn't show up. And from 1984... Until the present, they've been trying to regain access to the government. You want to hear the truth? All right. So today, freedom of religion, freedom of the exercise, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, all these things that we take for granted, listen to what you're hearing today and ask yourself, do we still have those exercises without any hindrance? And I say, nay, nay. But the Bible put another, but the Bible says that Satan would have another power in place to facilitate this transition. Daniel 7, verse 23. The fourth beast of Daniel, chapter 7, the power of Rome. But look at what the Bible predicted Rome will be able to do. Thus he said, 
The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour how much of the earth? The whole earth. Trample it and break it in pieces. Now, just so you can make the connection, how much of the earth did the devil want to control the whole thing? But he had to put a power in place to do it because he lost access. The Lord took it back. But in this tug of war over control and over the dictates of people's freedoms, the devil decided, I have another. So he put a power in place. And the beauty of this, brothers and sisters, is the Lord saw every move the devil made before he made it. So there's no mystery here. God is always a step ahead of him. God is always a step ahead of him. And that power reigned supreme for 1,260 years. And then in 1798, that power received a temporary wound. And the Bible said something's going to happen to that very power. The power of Rome, something happened. Revelation 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded or wounded to death. And his deadly wound was what? Healed. And how much of the world? All the world marveled and followed the beast. I can say today with assurance. I can say today with clarity. I can say today with certainty that there's not a single power admired around the world today as the head of the Vatican. Not a single power. Every political power bows to the authority of Rome. And regardless of who the pontiff may be, whether Pope Francis or Pope John or Pope Benedict or whoever the next one may be, if there's another one coming, no matter who the power is, the agenda is the same. And what's being pushed in America is unity, not based on God's Word, because the Bible says, sanctify them by your truth, your Word is truth. Does God want us to be unified based on His Word, yes or no? Of course He does. But unity today is not being pushed on the basis of the clarity and the certainty and the assurance of God's Word is being pushed based on the agenda of Rome. And watch this. You ask for the truth, you get it today. And watch this. And the attitude that Protestants had in the 1700s and 1800s and 1900s, and even up to the time when President Kennedy was voted in office, they don't have the same spirit today. They're making concessions with Rome. But did God's servant know that? Listen to this. Great Controversy, 1888, page 564, paragraph 5. The Pacific tone of Rome in the United States does not apply a change of heart. When I was in Washington in 2015, that's exactly what I heard when the Pope spoke to Congress. She is tolerant where she is what? Helpless, says Bishop O'Connor, one of the bishops of Rome. Religious liberty, listen to what he said, is merely endured until the opposite can be carried into effect without peril to the Catholic world. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So we'll go ahead and deal. We'll let religious liberty, we'll let religious liberty have its way until we can find a way to reverse it without affecting anything in our own agenda. And next week you're going to see it. I hope you bring a pair of eyes with you. Because you're going to see it. That's Rome's attitude. What about Protestants? Listen to the servant of the Lord. I always tell you, God is always a step ahead of the devil. Great Controversy, page 563, paragraph 1. Romanism is now regarded by Protestants with far greater favor than in former years. Is that a fact? Yes, it is. Look at the attitude evangelicals have towards Catholicism. You'll see it in a moment in a couple of videos I have for you today. The time was when Protestants placed a high value upon the liberty of conscience which had been so dearly purchased. In other words, there was a time that I could believe what I wanted to believe without people getting angry with me. But nowadays, you, you sound religious in these secular circles. You speak against the immorality in this world and see if the world doesn't turn against you. 
You don't have, you may believe this and vocalize that, but you cannot do that any longer with liberty of conscience. They'll put you out of buildings for speaking what you believe. But it doesn't end there. They taught their children to abhor popery and held that to seek harmony with Rome would be disloyalty to God. That's what the Protestant Reformation taught. But how widely different are the sentiments now expressed. In this book put together by uh, Chuck Colson and Richard John Newhouse, this was a document called Evangelicals and Catholics Toward a Common Mission Together. Next Sabbath, I hope you bring a pair of eyes with you because it's going to be straight up. If you want to hear the truth, you're at the right place. They've been working on uniting for a number of years and just uh, 2017, October 2017, there was a meeting held in Kansas City where the evangelicals and Catholics under the direction of Kenneth Copeland, they got together to work out the details so that we can get together. And just so that you don't think I'm making this up, I have those videos with me today. Great controversy. Look at this. The, how true this is. Romanism is now regarded by Protestants with far greater favor, uh, favor than in what? In former years. I'll just share that with you. But now I want you to see something. The Bible says in Revelation 17, verse 13, what are they going to have? Read this with me. These are of what? One mind, and they will give their power and authority to who? To the beast. Okay, I'm going to play the video now. Listen very carefully. You're going to see the first in the lines. Because Protestants, what is a Protestant? A Protestant is somebody that protests the dogmas and the false teachings of Rome. But that's not the attitude any longer among, among you know, we are Protestants. That's why the term is no longer called Protestants, it's called evangelicals, because they're no longer protesting. They're not protesting. They're seeking harmony. Evidence. Exhibit number one. Listen carefully. It, authenticity, humility, Pope Francis is the perfect example of this. Hmm. He, is a, he is doing everything right. You see, people will listen to what we say if they like what they see. see. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as our new pope, he was very, very symbolic in, you know, his first mass with people of AIDS, uh, his, his uh, kissing of, uh, of the disformed man, yeah. his loving the children, this authenticity, this humility, the caring for the poor. This is what the whole world expects us Christians to do. And when, we, when they go, oh, that's what a Christian does. I, in fact, there's a headline here in Orange County, and I love the headline. I saved it. It said, if you love Pope Francis, you'll love Jesus. <laughs> oh, that, that was the headline? That was the headline. Oh. It was the headline. I saved it. I showed it to a group of priests I was uh, speaking to a while back. Now, if you love Jesus, you'll love Pope Francis. Because we're supposed to love the Lord first. Come on, somebody say amen. And we're supposed to love everybody, not the other way around. But here's the point I'm going to make. That's a Protestant leader that's saying the Pope is doing everything right. But how could the Pope do everything right when the very power that he was established under, he received his power and authority from Satan himself? Now, this is not a sermon you're going to hear every place. You may seek for it, but you won't find it. But I've been given the responsibility to tell it like it is. Because we're living in the closing scenes. Why is there such a spirit? Why is there such a spirit of conciliatory uh, resonance between those who should be protesting what Rome is doing instead of, instead of standing on God's word? They're saying, hey, he's an example of what we all should be. Here's the reason why. God is in control. Revelation 17. Wait, let me go back to it. Revelation 17, 17, notice what the Bible says. For God has put it into their what? Hearts to fulfill his what? Purpose to be of what? One mind. And to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are what? Are fulfilled. Let me tell you something, brother. God is working this thing out. Sin will not reign forever. Can I get an amen somewhere? So God is saying the last pieces as Pharaoh in his determination to hold God's people in bondage, 
The Bible says God hardens Pharaoh's heart. God did not harden his heart. He was not open to the truth of God's leading. In the very same way, the pontiff is not open, although he may say so. The truth of God's Word is not the foundation on which they function. Tradition is above the Bible. So God is saying, if you want tradition, I'll put it in your mind and in his mind to unite. They'll give their power to you for one hour, and when that time is done, my kingdom shall reign forever and ever. Evidence number two to show you how much Protestant leaders are favoring Rome, as we read a moment ago, It's, admi it's admired today with far greater fervor than in former years. Exhibit number two. We have far more in common than what divides us. Listen when you carefully. talk about Pentecostals, Charismatics, Evangelicals, uh, Fundamentalist, Catholics, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, and on, on, and on, and on. Well, they would all say, we believe in the Trinity, we believe in the Bible, we believe in the resurrection, we believe salvation is through Jesus Christ. These are the big issues. Sometimes Protestants think that Catholics worship Mary like she's another God, but that's not exactly Catholic doctrine. There's the understanding, and, and people say, well, what are the saints all about? Are, you know, you're, why are you praying to the saints? And when you understand what they mean by what they're saying, there's a whole lot more commonality. Now, there's still real differences, no, no doubt about that. But the most important thing is, if you love Jesus, we're on the same team. The unity that I think we would see realistically is not a structural unity, but a unity of mission. And so when it comes to the family, we are co-workers in the field on this for the protection of what we call the sanctity of life, the sanctity of sex, and the sanctity of marriage. So there's a great commonality, and there's no division on any of those three. Many times people have been beaten down for taking a biblical stance, and they start to feel, well, maybe I'm, I'm out here all by yourself. No, you're not. The church is growing in Latin America. The church is growing in Asia. The church is growing in Africa. It's not growing in North America or Europe, but it is growing everywhere else. And so we kind of have this feeling that maybe we're not uh, uh, as, as influential, but we're far more influential than people realize. Okay, why is the church not growing in North America is a very important question. The church in South America and in Africa and in Europe, they are embracing the truth as, as, it's be, as it's being preached, but not here in America. But not here in America. Truth is not being embraced as it should be. And the commonality, we have more in common than what separates us. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Revelation 13, verse 2. Notice the words of conciliation. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So the power that Rome wields today was not given by the Lord. It was given by the very dragon that was kicked out of heaven. This is not something you hear every place. Let's go ahead and look at one more video to show you that. And I want you to hear carefully because what has been underway for thousands of years is being accomplished before our eyes, the very principles of Protestantism. And by the way, the, the greatest principle of Protestantism is the Bible and the Bible. Say it again, the Bible and the Bible only. But watch this, the clever way. This meeting that you're going to hear is an appeal to pastors of varying denominations by a representative of Rome telling them something that that Martin Luther, if he were alive, would turn over in his grave. Watch this. This is very important. Listen. We know that the first thousand years there was one church. It was called the Catholic Church. And the word Catholic means universal. It doesn't mean Roman. Catholic means if you're born again, raise your hand if you're born again. You're a Catholic. 
See how clever that is? Take back, redeem what belongs to you. We are Catholics. And then there was the split at the end of the first millennium. We had the Orthodox, East and West, two churches. Then 500 years later, we have Luther in his protest. Three churches in 1,500 years. Three denominations, not three churches. And then from Luther's protest onwards, 33,000 new denominations. I've come to understand that diversity is divine. It's Watch division it. that's diabolic. It's true what you were saying about the glory. I agree with you, of course it's true. The glory that the Father had, he gave to Jesus. The glory was the presence of God. What is the charismatic renewal? It's when we experience the presence of God. And he said, and I give them the glory, pragmatic reason, so that they may be one. It's the glory that glues us together, not the doctrines. Did you hear that? It's the glory. If you accept that Christ is living in me and the presence of God is in me and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. Because God will sort out all our doctrines when we get upstairs. He'll sort it out later. Therefore, Christian unity is the basis of our credibility because Jesus said until day one, they will not believe. The world will not believe, as they should, until we are one. Division destroys our credibility. It is fear that keeps us separated because fear is false evidence appearing real. It's an acronym. F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Because most of your fear is based on propaganda. Now, why is it historic? Because in 1999, the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Lutheran Church signed an agreement that brought an end to the protest. Luther believed that we were saved by grace through faith alone. Amen. But that's not it. The Catholic Church believed that we were saved by works. And that was the protest. In 1999, they wrote this together. Because in the Protestant church, we had a lot of cheap salvations. People were getting born again, but no fruit whatsoever. And because we didn't even look for fruit, it wasn't the issue. Because it wasn't necessary for salvation. And no, it's not. But it's a good judge if you are saved. So what these two churches did, they put the two definitions together. Listen to it. I'm reading verbatim from the Catholic Vatican website. Justification means that Christ himself is our righteousness. Amen. In which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father. To, together we Catholics and Protestants, Lutherans, believe and confess that by grace alone in faith, in Christ's saving works, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. This brought an end to the protest of Luther. Watch carefully. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over, is yours. In 1999, this was signed by the Lutheran Church, the Federation Worldwide. Later, about five years later, the Worldwide Methodists signed the same agreement, but as of today, we still have had no Protestant evangelical that will stand up and sign this agreement to agree with our brothers and sisters that we are saved by grace through faith to good works. And I believe that's something that needs to be fixed. There's a challenge for you. So the protest has been over for 15 years. And I get a bit cheeky here because I challenge my Protestant pastor friends. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Wow. Is that clever? Is that Maybe clever? now we're all Catholics again. That means we're all Catholics today. But we are reformed. 
We are Catholic in the universal sense. We are not protesting the doctrine of salvation by the Catholic Church anymore. We now preach the same gospel. We now preach you are saved by grace through faith alone. The word alone was the argument for 500 years. The word alone is there. You can read it yourself. The protest is over. The protest is over. The protest is not over. Come on, somebody. Amen. Get rid of all your doctrines. Let's just get together on one basis. The protest is over. But let me end with this quotation right here. The protest is over. The protest is not over. Get rid of all that you believe and come under the guidance of the Roman. Notice Rome is not merging with us. Everybody's being called back unto Rome. Everybody's being called back, and he says, up until this day, notice he didn't say no evangelicals signed. He said no Protestants signed. But they, got, they took care of that in October of 2018. Listen to what the Lord has showed us long before. One of the leading churches of the United States Great Controversy 445. Notice all the things that Rick Warren said we have in common. He said we have in common. Uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions. Listen. Then Protestant America will have what? Formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. Is that happening today? The last part is yet to take place, but the unification between Protestants and Catholics is well underway. And my last video, I have to show this to you. Is it okay? Thank you for a hearty amen. You saw Rome's appeal, but you have to see the response to Protestantism. Here it is. The biggest church split in history. Amen. When when The Catholic Church split you know the story the beginning of the protesting church now, now, you really stop and think about it. But among, among the people of love, we're called protesters. We've been protesting for 500 years, baby. Yeah, that's been 500 years ago. Now, that brother, now, hey, that's a church split, brother. I mean, that's the church split of all church splits. I, really? Now, <laughs> October the 31st, 1999, representatives of the Catholic and the Lutheran churches gathered in Augsburg, Germany, and signed a joint declaration on the subject of justification. And so five hundred years of arguments, misunderstandings, and sometimes wars began to give way to reconciliation and recognition of the gifts of the Holy Spirit as placed within the body of Christ. It ended. And all of the... <laughs> Well, I, I don't I won't take the time to to go into it, but well let me just read you let me let, let me just read you the, the main article out of this. Together we confess. Are you listening now? By grace alone. 
in faith in Christ's saving work and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good and His works. Is that all I'm going to get out of that? <laughs> Together we confess. I am reading to you current Catholic doctrine. Am I right, Mateo? Am I right, Bruno? I'm am I right, Ron? This is it. current. This, hey, this has been signed into Catholic doctrine. Together we confess by grace alone in faith in Christ's saving work and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to do good works. Uh, Mark, you see any way to improve that? <laughs> I can't think of that. Huh? Huh? The only thing I'd put in there, please don't make me wear that robe. <laughs> no, that. <laughs> no. Come on, man. Yeah. That's all you answered. This is coming together in the unity of the faith. And this is just not between the Catholics and the Protestants. Here's what. Here, here's what took place all those years. When that church split took place and that spirit of division sat down on his throne, we've been dividing ever since. That's the root of it right there. But the day that they put their signatures on this and they prayed over this and they laid hands on this and, and worship God over this. Listen, this thing took five years to put together. There was a lot of prayer and there was a, a, a lot of crying out to God in this until it came down to that one statement. Amen. Amen. And it opened the door. I mean, the Spirit of God got that spirit of division by the throat and just slammed him down under our feet, praise God, and now it's up to us to keep him there. Wow. Hmm. Ending quote. Faith of Our Fathers, page 310. I hope you're listening today. When Protestants shall stretch her hand across the gulf to clasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, that satanic influence, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions. Lord have mercy, here it is. Then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. Never before could that ever have been said. And the last quote, January 16, 2019, the Vatican News. Pope Francis has reminded the faithful that ecumenism is not something optional. Again, this year we are called to pray so that all Christians may once again be a single family according to God's will so that they may all be one, he said, pointing out that ecumenism is not something optional. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. Church, we are standing 
in the midst of movements that have never happened before. And God is saying it's time for the church to wake up. What I showed you today could not have been said 30 years ago or 20 years ago. But what you have seen today is just a glimpse into what is actually taking place around our world. And the most significant movements are taking place here in America. Why is this passage so vitally important? It's because the beast that is supposed to secure our freedoms is beginning to speak like a dragon, the United States. Rome is pushing. Evangelicals are embracing. Protestants are merging. And God is saying, what's going to happen to my woman? What's going to happen to her? One day she's going to be clothed in white robes. Come on, say amen. The church is going to once again be delivered as the Lord has delivered her at every other juncture. If it's your desire to be a part of that deliverance when the Lord gets here, if it's your desire to hold on to the truth of God's word as it is in Jesus, would you stand with me today? I've given you a lot to consider. The next Sabbath, we're going to walk through the specifics of what's happening here in America, what's happened around the world, and the final movements that are taking place in this United States of America, this country where freedom of religion is being tolerated. And whether you know it or not, the majority of our chief justices are Catholic. Coincidental? No. You'll find out next week it's not coincidental. It's completely by design. The final movements will be rapid. It's time for the sleeping church to wake up. Father in heaven, this morning, I know I've shared some things that are very, very concentrated. But Lord, you've given us this message not to ignore it, but to proclaim it. You've called us to stand on sola scriptura and in a world that's being eroded and tradition is being inserted where the word of God is to be. In a world where Rome, that last beast that is devouring the earth, is calling us to be under its wings. Lord, we pray that today we will abide under your wings and we will stand on the foundation of your truth, on the certainty of your word. We will not listen to the voice of the dragon. We will not find our security in the dictates of humanity, but the foundation and the unmovable rock, Christ Jesus. Lord, give us wisdom today to know what to do in light of these times. And as we hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, may we be a people of urgency determined and fueled to let our brothers and our sisters know through religious liberty that we are called to take this stand. And the light you've given to us, may it shine even brighter until that perfect day. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people said, Amen.